Hi, so this is part two of the style, language, and word choice uh, video lecture. We're going to be using the same documents that uh, were used in the last one. Um, I am at my office in E-Town, and it just started storming like hell here. So if, you know, there's thunder or whatever, just ignore it. Um, so we left off with thought verbs. Now, thought verbs, uh, you want to eliminate thought verbs, and this is part of, um, of style. This is sort of one of those guidelines that were uh, best practices for writing fiction, and, uh, which is to, and for this example, is to eliminate thought verbs. Um, as you can see here, thought verbs are all of these things like I thought, I knew, I understood, I realized, I believed, I remembered. Um, just a uh, a little uh, pet peeve of mine, you almost never need to say that I remembered something or that he remembered something. You're narrating a story so we know that the character remembers it. So this always makes me crazy. Um, but these are other thought verbs. Um, and then you also want to eliminate all traces of sensory verbs like saw, heard, tasted, felt, smelled. Now the reason why you do this um, is because the, I would say this is probably the number one rule in creative writing, and maybe even especially so in fiction. Uh, it's also pretty huge in screenwriting, is show, don't tell. This is the number one rule in creative writing. And what show, don't tell means is that if there's a way that you can show the reader something and have them come to their own realizations or their own conclusions based on what you showed them, it forces the writing to be more active, and it forces the reader to be a more active participant in the act of reading. So it's always better to show than to tell. And by tell, what this really means is explaining. Explaining how somebody felt. So instead of saying something like, John felt sad, you can show us that John felt sad. Maybe describe John crying, or maybe John is shaking, maybe John feels sick because he is so sad. You can describe those things. You can show us those things and we will understand that John is sad. So it's always better to show rather than to tell or explain. Now eliminating, eliminating thought verbs and sensory verbs helps with this. So instead of saying that, you know, uh, John knew that she was a good person, Give us details. Show us some of whoever the her is. Show us some of her behavior, some of her mannerisms. Give us, a, give us some dialogue. Show us that she's a good person, and we'll understand that she is. And we'll understand that John thinks that she is. Um, the same is true for sensory verbs. Now, uh, sensory verbs are crucially important. Um, last week, we discussed um, using sensory details to pull the reader into an image. Uh, when you're using image details and description to pull them into the story. That's still true, but if there's a way that you can describe what your narrator is seeing, uh, tasting, smelling, feeling, rather than saying, uh, for example, I saw a bird outside the window. You can write, a bird fluttered past the window. You create an image for the reader to um, visualize themselves, which makes them a more active part of the writing, rather than saying, this is what happens. So, again, this is part of show, don't tell. This shows us, this tells us. Um, and, you know, kind of the underlying rule, uh, the underlying truth of this is that actions are always more powerful than just stating observations. Um, and this goes along with the next thing, unpacking the moment instead of knowing the moment. All of these go together. So what unpacking the moment means is, um, say I want to describe, I want my, I want to, the reader to understand that um, my narrator is feeling very anxious. First thing I can do, uh, going back to variation, sentence variation, is maybe I could use um, uh, shorter sentences, which will which will create a sense of tension in the reader. Um, but I would want to make sensory observations through action. So instead of saying like, I felt anxious, I could unpack all of those little details like, um, you know, 
uh, the skin started to crawl across my skin. Uh, my heart beat faster and faster. Um, sweat collected on my brow. All of these things, that you build them up with actions, but all of these things lead us to understanding uh, that the narrator feels anxious. Another part of this is, and this all goes along with show, don't tell, unpacking the moment, cutting thought verbs, cutting sensory, uh, sensory verbs, all of these things go together. But you can also bury character descriptions or details in actions or gestures. Instead of just saying that, um, in my first novel, the one character has a, um, has a scar right here. And instead of saying, uh, her character's name is Anna, instead of just saying Anna has a scar uh, below her collarbone, um, you can unpack that detail through actions or gestures. Maybe something like, um, when Anna went to go, when Anna went to brush the hair behind her ear, it unveiled, it, uh, it revealed the scar below her collarbone. So instead of just saying, this scar exists, um, it's buried within descriptions and details and action. I mean, it's buried within actions and gestures. Um, what this does is it makes the writing feel more natural. The way that you're unveiling these details and description is more natural. It's not, um, I'm just going to give you a paragraph of description of what this character looks like. Um, also, allow actions and dialogue to reveal thoughts. Stay out of your readers' heads as much, I mean, out of your characters' heads as much as possible. Um, you know, for those of you who have take, already taken a psych course, you've probably heard that the majority of human communication occurs through body language and through actions and through facial expressions. So you should always, when you're writing dialogue, um, you should always build in, we'll get to this when we get to dialogue, but you should always build in facial expressions and body language. You can reveal a lot of a character's thoughts, feelings, a lot of their personality through um, their body language and through their dialogue. As I've been recording these videos, I've been watching them um, just to kind of review how they're going. And as you can see now, I'm a very, I mean, as you can probably guess if you haven't had me before, I'm a very fidgety person. I do a lot with my hands. I'm always moving. I'm kind of an anxious person. Well, I'm really an anxious person. But just think of if you're trying to describe me to a reader, and I stutter a lot, I say um a lot, you can build in these personality traits. Uh, you can reveal them through action and dialogue. Instead of saying, Professor Grimm is an anxious and fidgety and neurotic person, you can show that through the hand gestures I make, uh, the way I stutter and um, say um, uh, and uh, you know some of my body language and facial expressions facial expressions, you can reveal a lot about a character that way. Now, we're going to move on to active and passive voice. This is a big part of style, too. And this document is attached here as well. Active and passive voice is uh, something that's a little uh, kind of difficult to get used to. You should have learned about this in your English 100 class, and if you had me for English 100, you better not have forgotten about this. Um, this is a big part of um, being able to write well. Uh, passive voice is, uh, you want your, your writing to always be active. You want it to be as full of action as possible. You want characters and objects and things doing something to something else. Uh, you want, um, you want your characters, act, uh, objects, whatever, you want them to be acting, not being acted upon. When your writing is active, when you use active voice, um, it keeps the reader in the moment. It's starting to thunder really bad. Um, so there are some examples here. Uh, active voice uses acting verbs to indicate that a subject acts. Passive voice combines to be verbs with acting verbs to indicate that it exists. It exists that something receives the action. So, for example, passive voice, it, this is a good example. The dog was bitten by the boy. So, the boy is being acted, um, the, the boy is being acted upon by the dog. Active voice is the dog bit the boy. The dog is acting upon the boy. Um, I'm honestly not exactly sure why, but often we think uh, in passive voice. So, it comes out a lot in writing. Um, 
So it's something that you have to consciously work on. This, uh, there are times when you should use passive voice, and I'll let you guys read through this, but a good rule of thumb is to always try to use active voice, unless there is no way to say it without using active voice. Um, so I want you to carefully review this uh, document. It goes into great detail here. Um, and if you still have your pocket style manual from FYS and uh, from English 100, there's a great, absolutely fantastic section in there about active and passive voice. Um, and this is something that will take some practice to get used to. So when I give you feedback um, and track changes on your papers, I will be looking for passive voice. And I'll tell you when, when you use passive voice. Um, you know, this isn't something writers are typically conscious of. This is something that kind of comes out in the revision process. Um, and this is something that takes practice to get used to. So look over this document and uh, try to start practicing with that. All right, so language, uh, word choice in language is broken up. Um, language is broken up into uh, word choice and the type of language that you use. Um, so word choice is everything from vocabulary. Uh, you don't want your vocabulary to be repetitive. One of the uh, rules of thumb is that you should never use the same word uh, in the same sentence. So look for a synonym if you have to use the word, uh, if you have to use the, for example, if you have to use the word danger twice in a sentence, find a synonym for the second time. Um, I typically, I really believe that you shouldn't use the same word within two or three sentences. And the reason why is that repetition, the repetition of ideas, but also the repetition of sentence structure and also the repetition of words can distract the reader. And you never want to distract the reader, ever. You never want that to happen. If you distract them, then they get pulled out of the moment. And then you can lose them and your writing's not as effective. Um, and this is something I will also focus on when I give you feedback. Um, and then again, formal and informal language in narration uh, you need to decide, the key here is consistency, you need to decide what kind of language you want to use when you're telling your story. If you want to use uh, complicated vocabulary, if you want to use bigger words, if you want to use more sophisticated words in your narration, or if you want to use more informal and simple language, uh, if you want to use slang in your narration, I strongly advise against that, it almost never works well, but some people can pull it off. Um, the key is to be consistent in your narration. Dialogue, uh, this is a little bit grayer, and we'll spend a lot of time on dialogue later in the semester. But um, I typically have my characters speak in um, formal language, not, well, semi-formal language. I do use contractions in um, dialogue. But you can also use colloquialisms like local, sl uh, local terminology. Um, if you're from South Central Pennsylvania, there are a lot of Pennsylvania Dutch words used around here. Uh, slang and dialect. Uh, the key here is to again be consistent. If you have just in one passage, one piece of dialogue where a character uses slang it's, or dialect, it's going to stand out against the rest of the dialogue. Um, but you can, you know, you might have one character who speaks in dialect and slang and the other characters speak differently. These are the choices that you have to make. Um, but the key with this is to be consistent. Um, so as we move through the rest of the week, through the short stories that we're going to read, there are also some other readings on style, language, and voice. But as we move through uh, this week, all of this stuff will start to make more sense. Um, I strongly advise that you save these co copies of these or print them out for yourself. And uh, really, uh, oh, um, that's about it for style, language, and voice.